Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to submit to the authority of our televisions and wallow in our shallow consumerist lives with John Carpenter's 1988 film, They Live. Let's get to it. We open on a grungy downtown area where Rowdy Rowdy Piper is walking through a train depot, living the old hobo life, despondent at the lack of folks available to stab with his hobo knife. He continues on like this for quite a ways, eventually finding himself in a shanty town, where he has the opportunity to bed down for the night. He goes out looking for work the next day and has the misfortune of falling in with a union, which is the only way he can earn an honest day's pay. Despite his membership, he's still despised for his lack of permanent residence. Frank offers to show him to a shelter that evening, and Rowdy signals his interest with a flip of his lustrous locks. Unfortunately, these two KG alphas don't like following or being followed unless they know the other party, so they warily head in the same general direction. This level of communication lock will come into play later on. Luckily, they eventually make it in time to enjoy the evening's ration of hobo chili, made with love from a classic recipe with only the essentials. An onion, a shoestring, and some Mr. Coffee. They enjoy the sunset together and philosophize about free market capitalism and the working man. When Piper finds himself wandering around that evening, he takes in some outdoor television. The broadcast is momentarily taken over by a professor who's yammering about mind control signals and whatnot, as one does. Roddy notices the doomsday preacher seems to be influenced by the signal. Now he's alert and inquisitive like a coyote. The next morning, the professor is back. This time, Gilbert sees it and goes running off into the church next door. Roddy's got nothing better to do, so he wanders in to investigate further, stumbling upon what appears to be a counterfeit Ray-Ban operation. He finds the guy from the TV in the sanctuary. They're talking about boosting the signal in some sort of revolution. We gotta find new people, strong people. Hey, Rowdy Roddy Piper is new, strong and a person. He gets startled and runs off, but isn't done yet. He borrows some knocks and engages in a stealth covert operation, making himself invisible by not moving. He has all night to wait for something to happen, but when it does, it really does. The police science division shows up with their science guns, ready to science your face off. They storm the church and bulldoze the shantytown. He manages to run off and avoid capture. The next day he returns. Inside the church he finds one box the police missed, and he scurries off with it like a rat. He takes a brief rest in an alley and crosses his fingers for some old playboys, but it turns out it's just more sunglasses. He takes a pair and hides the rest, secure in the fact that he'll always have a replacement for a lost pair of shades. But he immediately finds that these are no ordinary glasses. They pull the veil back from the world, revealing hidden messages for breeders and soy boys all around him. It appears that all print media has subliminal messages to encourage compliance and distraction. But that's not all. Some folks look like they've lost their precious face skins. He seems shook but continues exploring, which turns out to be a bad idea, because he becomes overwhelmed and loses control of his inner monologue. They all start whispering into their Apple Watches about a suspect who can see, so he runs off. He finds himself in an escalating sequence of violence until he stumbles backwards into a bank. He confirms his intent to do something or something and continues to make decisions that are objectively bad for the movement. He ends up in a parking garage where he takes Holly hostage and has her drive him home while repeatedly expressing his exhaustion through acting a lot. He's not totally sure what to do next. When she tells him she works for a TV station, it stirs something back into his memory. He begins to excitedly tell her about the mind control and then she excitedly pushes him through a window. He manages to hobble off before the police arrive. The next morning, he has to wander into town hungry and tired. He lost his glasses at Holly's. He goes to his secret hiding spot and finds the box missing. When he goes to retrieve them from a truck, it dumps him back into the alley for no reason. All in all, he finds he's having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. He tries to get his friend Frank to put on the glasses and join the revolution against their consumerist overlords. They get to another classic miscommunication in which they both refuse and insist upon each other in the most brutally violent way imaginable. <laughs> What were we talking about? Oh yeah, so Frank actually ends up trying on the glasses and immediately poops his pants in fright as he observes wonders beyond imagination. But Piper knows just how to calm him. Life's a bitch. She's back in heat. Ooh, I, I really don't care for that language. With a new strong relationship, they immediately run off and rent a room together. They scream through their concerns about what to do next, ultimately deciding to seek out the makers of the glasses. This turns out to be the easiest possible solution, because Gilbert's right here, and he immediately invites them to a resistance meeting. When they arrive, we see that they told the kids? Kids can't keep secrets? They receive contact lenses to replace their glasses, and then spend some time learning about how the skinless weirdos are slowly winning people over and depleting our resources through capitalism. Then they help themselves to the free 
free gun buffet. Everyone agrees they need to do more, but the brainwashing signal originates from an unknown source. Holly then appears, apparently having tried on Piper's glasses and waking up to a new reality. Roddy barely gets a chance to awkwardly stare at her before the police bust in and start gunning everyone down. Frank and Roddy find themselves cornered but get an assist from one of the alien watches when it temporarily opens a gate into a subterranean tunnel system. They manage to sneak past a couple of second string Ghostbusters talking into their ghost detectors like noobs and find themselves in the grand ballroom at a bougie banquet for the human power elite. They're greeted by an old pal who went from homeless on Monday to tuxedo on Wednesday and just assumes they're there on friendly terms. Being the hospitable type, he takes them on a grand tour, eventually arriving at the signal distribution center. This gets them excited about moving on and finding the dish. Upon request, they willingly provide their authorization and work their way through the building, killing who they can and trying to avoid harming humans. They eventually stumble upon Holly, who, as always, just seems to be there. Unfortunately for both us and them, she completed her convoluted character arc off screen and has unknowingly switched allegiances again. Apparently, she wants to not only comply and gain the opportunity for riches, but is also comfortable deploying headshots. On the roof, we find that Roddy gets rowdy when heartbroken, taking vengeance for his fallen comrade and sacrificing himself to interrupt the signal for the people, like any good commie would. He dies slowly as the farce is revealed to the public, and the people slowly wake up. And that was They Live, an interesting high concept film that probably could have been tightened up a bit, but it was still fun. And if you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.